Hello, welcome. My name is Sarah. Today's coffee conversation, we're looking at a work by Michael Scott called Large Solar Device. This painting forms part of the permanent collection in the Hugh Lane Gallery. This is the piece. A huge canvas. In fact, it's a diptych. That's two canvases, often side by side, but in this case stacked on top of each other. Um, it's two, three, four centimetres by one, five, three centimetres in height, um, or in width rather, so that's enormous. It's really, really big, over seven and a half feet tall and nearly five feet wide. Um, what do we see? We see a glowing orange disc pressing against the boundaries of the upper part of the canvas. And it seems to be radiating streams of liquid. Uh, certainly the pigment is, is flaring out and it's also dripping down from its core and running down the canvas below. And this dripping really emphasizes that sense of unpredictability and um, a kind of sense that the artist has limited control on the artwork. Um, at the same time, it looks intensely joyous. Uh, it's sun-like, the rays are spilling, um, like it's been impulsively painted in a moment of sheer exuberance. Now, midway across the composition, as I said, there's that, there's a horizon line, what we see as a horizon line. Uh, and of course, we know it's an actual division in, in, in this case between the two canvases. Um, the canvas is unprimed, it's in its raw state. So it's very porous, hugely absorbent of color in, in this state. And also that beige color is quite distinctive and a lovely contrast to the strong orange tones. Here is the painting. Uh, this is it on exhibit in the Irish Museum of Modern Art in 2014 in one of their galleries. So it's the, it's the middle painting, obviously, and nice to see it from a distance, I think, but also to see how it looks scale-wise uh, with two large paintings either side of it, but also to see the frame. Now, Scott uses tempera uh, in this, as a medium on, on this canvas and many others. Um, of course, it's an alternative to oil paint, oil paint and acrylic paint. Uh, traditionally, it was a kind of, it was a predecessor to oil paint. It was um, made using pigment and egg yolk as, as a medium, and now it's made using, using plant gums. Um, and, and traditionally, it was a very traditional material, typical in, in medieval and early Renaissance painting. But in this case, the artist chose to use it because he liked the effect. It's water soluble, it's, so it can be diluted. It can be made quite thin. It's very, it can, and, and because it's diluted, it can be very liquid. In this case, that would have been useful in terms of the drips. It dries very quickly. And, and the effect is to give a kind of matte effect, uh, which has a, a, a quite a strong opacity despite how diluted it is. Why did uh, Patrick Scott paint this painting? Um, it was 1964 and he was moved to, to respond in, in political terms. He was inspired by the H-bombs, the hydrogen bombs and their test detonation during the Cold War. So we'll just move forward. Uh, this just to remind you um, of, of, of what those detonations look like. So he was, it, it, it was quite common uh, among artists at the time. And uh, it caused and the potential for human destruction, of course, was, was so enormous and it would have caused significant alarm for so many people, but artists were prompted to, to react. Um, the H-bomb, of course, it, it, you need no, no reminding that it's the most destructive nuclear weapon ever made, 10 times more destructive than any other nuclear device. And Scott has said on more than one occasion that he regarded this and the other paintings in the series as a form of protest against these tests and the utter madness that was the arms race. He said, let's go back to our own painting. He said, the ambiguity of calling them devices and the reason for still testing weapons of mass destruction, which had already been used with such tragic consequences in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, left me outraged. Another image, um, this is two, painted two years earlier from large solar device art painting. So this is called a yellow device, a smaller painting painted uh, with tempera on unprimed canvas again. And that's another of the example in the series. This is a purple device painted in 1963, kind of reminiscent of a moonscape. Um, a little bit 
like um, a coronavirus under the microscope, but that's just my thinking at the moment. Um, so large solar device, of course, is a very specific reference to the sun. Uh, this is also possibly sun-like, um, solar being the, the clue. Um, and it does, of course, mimic the sun's explosive burst of light. And it's worth noting that while all of these paintings in the series of the device series really embody that explosive release of energy intentionally, of course, um, it, not just in the way they're made, but also in their appearance. Uh, it's also, you could say, for all that it's a political statement in one way, there's something of the terrible beauty about these. They seem in, in so many ways like a celebration too, which of course are not meant to be, but um, we can't help reveling in their beauty. Just, yeah. Now, who is Patrick Scott and how did he come to paint this series and where did he go from there? He was an artist and a designer and living and working in Dublin during the mid to late 20th century with a considerable legacy. So let's just look at that. Here's a lovely picture of him in his studio in later life. Uh, so well known, of course, and we'll get to that for his gold leaf paintings, as we see in the background. Um, his contribution was enormous, his talent considerable, but he was really a very um, quiet person who liked to work in his own studio, where he, he worked throughout his life on Bagot Lane. Very unfussy person, um, very highly regarded among his peers, and of course, a very wide audience. And I think his aesthetic, that, that aesthetic sense, those simple, um, elegant forms really summed up what he was about. He had many exhibitions of his work as a painter and a printmaker over a very long career. Solo shows at the Taylor Gallery in Kildare Street, uh, an exhibition in the Hugh Lane Gallery in 2002. And the last exhibition that was held was in 2014. And it was a very substantial survey of his work. It was called Image, Space and Light and uh, divided between the Irish Museum of Modern Art and the Visual in Carlow, and of course, both very big spaces. So it was a huge retrospective and it managed to convey that, that really the sheer breadth of, of his achievement of all his activities over um, fine art, design, architecture. A um, real tribute to his life and work. And very sadly, he died um, the evening before the opening of the exhibition. He was born in 1921 in West Cork uh, on a large coastal farm uh, in at Kilbritton. He was the youngest of four children. Um, during the 1930s, the family's farm was almost bankrupt um, and the family um, was rescued by his sister Jane's companion, who was well off apparently. She helped them, a woman called Linda Parbury. And she paid for Scott to go to school in St. Columbus in Dublin and also gave him a substantial a uh, thousand pounds apparently to study architecture in Dublin. He had wanted to be a painter, but this was considered wildly impractical. And um, so architecture was the choice. And so during the war years, he went to UCD and studied architecture. He came, became significantly at this time, he became involved with and exhibited with a, a group called the White Stag Group. So here he is as a student in UCD. Now, the White Stag Group had chosen, were a group of artists who had chosen to exile in Ireland during the war. And they were very much, um, uh, European modernists, un unapologetically so. Um, and Scott's early paintings painted with this group and during this time are comparatively representational, as you'll see here. This is called Bird at the Zoo um, from 1943, quite a small piece, 45 by 60. Um, so these, these representational, represent, representational paintings um, are, are, are just or Scott developing his practice, developing uh, his motifs. But you can see here, I think already, how the lines and the grid uh, that you will see later in his work are beginning to form and the circle. Um, and these themes, of course, eventually would dominate his work. Uh, he's very dismissive of this early work. Uh, uh, he said of his efforts, he said, I was a kind of primitive, really um, an Irish grandma Moses. 
Now, after graduating from UCD, he went to work for Michael Scott, a very well-known architect and no relation, uh, certainly a foremost modernist architect. Um, so the two Scots worked together for 15 years. Um, and it was around 1960 that he, he stopped working officially as an architect, but they remained, uh, Michael Scott and he remained very close friends and uh, professional um, uh, colleagues for the rest of their lives. Um, during his time with uh, Michael Scott, he was closely involved in the de development of Basaris, uh, and he designed the mosaics, um, which are such a prominent feature of the building. Now his artistic potential only really began to be recognized in the late 1950s. And he was uh, selected to represent Ireland at the Guggenheim uh, International Exhibition in 1958 with this painting, A Girl Carrying Grasses. Really, really lovely painting, uh, 1958 and quite large, 183 by 122. At this stage, oil on canvas. And um, this was also shown at the Museum of Modern Art that same year. Um, and then with this painting and two others, he was asked to represent Ireland in 1960 at the uh, Venice Biennale. And so all of these successes combined uh, to allow him to have the confidence to give, to give up architecture or to really to concentrate full time on his painting. And it was the 60s that saw the artist move into his prime. Um, first with the large device paintings that we've seen, um, where his lifelong obsession with the, with the sphere, we see it here, even how, how it uh, was formed during these years and developed uh, fully for the next decades. Um, by the mid 60s, the device paintings had given way to the restrained abstract gold paintings for which uh, Scott is so well known. Uh, this is an example, it's part of the Hugh Lane's permanent collection and it's from mid-career, 1986, and it's called Chinese Landscape. Gold leaf, uh, as we see in the, in the either sinking or rising sun, I feel rising, um, tempera, uh, the white swirls on the lower part of the canvas. Um, it's one of multiple works created using gold leaf and this began for Scott during the 1960s and now if you apply gold leaf to a canvas it would naturally crack but Scott kind of defined the art if you like and experimented and he was determined to do this so <clears throat> he um he he just he discovered an acrylic adhesive that could be used on the canvas and experimented with it and by putting the gold leaf on top of this um, it was flexible enough to hold on the fabric, on the material. Um, and he liked, of course, and it, you know, all of us find attractive that combination of textures, that the kind of raw linen mixed with the lustrous uh, gold um, and, it, and it very attractive. Now I see on the lower part of the canvas, the mountains are, are outlined by these rows of parallel curved lines uh, painted in tempera paint and very kind of similar patterns to the types of patterns that would have been um, raked into the gravel of formal oriental gardens. Now that, that sun there, it's very sharply defined as a contrast um, to, the, to the mountains, which are very simplified. And it's very still, very calm, very restful image. Now when talking about Patrick Scott, it's really important that we talk about design because design remained a huge part of his artistic output throughout his career. Um, he was a consultant to a design company, Signa, and designed uh, many things. Probably among the most well-known probably is uh, that distinctive black and orange livery for the CIE trains, those black and orange stripes. Now apparently these, this was inspired by his favorite cat, uh, Miss Mouse. Um, so he translated her black, white and orange coat into those horizontal band, bands that we, we know so well. Um, a great cat lover, I believed. At one point he had 16 cats. Um, he also ventured very successfully into set design, um, working uh, on touring productions um, among many things, but most notably maybe for Play Sings Playboy of the Western World. Now, how he came to his more mature um, 
idiom, more more mature kind of aesthetic, if you like, these gold paintings, um, was really determined by, by two things. Um, one was his friendship with the American painter, a man called Morris Graves, who had moved to Ireland and looked to Scott for architectural advice, and they became great friends. And Graves, Graves was, um, was interested in Zen Buddhism and had visited Japan and really identified with the Jap that kind of traditional uh, Japanese ethos where every aspect of life is infused with an aesthetic sense. And really Scott felt very in tune with this. Despite not having visited China or Japan until the 80s, his work began to be infused with this kind of aesthetic. I had never formally studying Zen, but again, that kind of meditative quality that, that we'll, we'll see uh, in, in a minute or two looking at other works. And the other thing that was to, um, to change his aesthetic was when in the early 1960s, <coughs> he traveled by train across the country to Galway to work on a refurbishment of, a, of an old a Georgian house, in fact, and the house was owned by the film director John Houston. And while travelling on the train and looking out, he was really intrigued by the, the diffuse, the watery light over the Midland bogs, and he began to think about how he would paint uh, that and how he would get uh, that, that sort of idea across. And here we'll see, excuse me, <coughs> Um, this is called Still Water, and uh, it's part of Dublin City Galleries, the Hugh Lane Galleries uh, permanent collection again. It's painted in 1962. So this is uh, one of the works that he produced that represented the Boglands, the Midlands, and um, it's called the Bog Series. So how he, how he got across the problem of conveying what he saw was by taking a canvas um, and dampening it. And un unprimed canvas, so wetting the canvas, um, and then applying tempera, and that soluble paint as we talked about. Uh, and so the pigment would really spread and soak into the texture of that damp fabric. Um, this is a series of works, as I said, which is part of the Bog series. And in all of them, we see, um, we can imagine Scott, I think, sitting on the train and passing this uh, by quickly. Uh, that, that the horizontal strips of formless marks, which are kind of like um, veget vegetation, certainly they evoke the idea of vegetation, as if we're seeing it through a mist of rain, um, and of course painted in those earthy tones, uh, on, on, on top of the earthy tone of the unprimed canvas. Now it's striking, I think, looking back to his early work from the 1940s onwards, and how um, two features um, recur persistently um, in different ways, but they nevertheless recur. And one is the circle. So back to this painting from 19, this is from 1958, and, and how, how often it occurred in his paintings, variously represented in the sun, as we've seen in the solar devices, uh, ponds, as we saw in a work in, in the 1940s, um, trees and in this case a head um, and then then the other theme is the grid now this is a painting from 1957 called the wires of the lagoon and um, so his interest in grid-like forms right angles etc geometric organization regularity which uh, formed part of of uh, of his of his idiom with his gold paintings it was begun it was seen from a very early stage now in the Bog series examples, um, we saw how the paint soaks and spreads into the raw damp and canvases, and both circles, in this case, well, circles really fade away inevitably. Um, this way of working was going to be problematic. Where do you go if you keep uh, diffusing and you keep diluting? Um, and uh, the, 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 the paintings become slightly, the images become slightly structureless. Um, so by 1962, things changed quite dramatically. Um, he really, Scott began to introduce elements that allowed him to uh, restore a more coherent form. And the first of this uh, development of the more coherent forms began with the device paintings, the, the paintings that we've seen from the very beginning. 
let's just go back to our own device, this piece here. So, so he, he moved from the bog paintings into these, these device paintings where shapes began to take a more solid form again. Um, and this, these paintings, it seems quite a short step then from these to his more mature works, his gold paintings. Now gold painting, uh, gold in painting in general, of course, is a beautiful material, but it also comes with very definite connotations, a Byzantine art, early Renaissance painting. And um, it's very definitely a symbol uh, of, it's a symbol of value, it's a symbol of significance or importance. So between, between the use of gold leaf and tempera, Scott was very, very clearly enjoying using ancient materials in new ways uh, and using ancient materials in this very um, much more modern approach. Now, um, it's fair to say, I think that Scott's paintings, for all that they, the gold leaf paintings reference icono iconographic painting and icons, they are not in themselves um, that, intended to be that. They have a very different aesthetic, um, more a Japanese, uh, a sort of cooler aesthetic. Um, and, and given his informal interests in Zen, um, and it's interesting to note, I think, that the circles and squares in gold paintings, which we look at now, this circle here, and um, this is a gold painting from 1979. Um, so that, that the circles and circles within circles and that square um, and those concentric patterns, they really um, are quite meditative. Um, quite calm. Um, now, with regard to uh, how he had go well, with regard to form, and um, it's interesting that gold leaf comes only and only comes in standard eight centimeter squares. So this uh, eight centimeter square form was to provide a constant for Scott. It was a structural unit in terms of allowing him to build um, build his paintings, if you like, build his form, build his design along uh, while going along with the, with the restrictions of the material. Now, the gold leaf, it's, it should be said, that is, this is real gold, in fact, and it's pounded down uh, gold leaf to be really very thin. Um, and gold, of course, is quite... Um, it's quite malleable, it's quite elastic, and these sheets are really very, very fine. They're almost transparent. And of course, that given the, the eight centimeter square and the fineness of them, they has to be incredibly carefully laid and, and, and his paintings would have to be calculated to an absolute exact point um, and laid out beforehand. So the point I'm trying to make really is that, uh, that trying to make is that those um, those kind of controlled accidents, which were the device paintings, where paintings were paint leached into the canvas, also with the bog paintings. Um, by the time he introduced gold leaf um, in the mid sixties, um, things of course were much more controlled, and this led to a kind of drastic change in the appearance of his painting. So no more spilled pigment, um, no more leaching into wet canvas. Um, this was quite controlled, to say the least. Now moving back, this is the same year he made this, that he made large solar device. And it's quite, I think, reminiscent, but shows just uh, how quickly his practice changed, and how Go Leaf uh, gave him a kind of um, a, a pictorial language, a much more st um, strict set of rules, even if you like. So here we see a bisected golden disc, and it would kind of takes up about the same kind of position on the canvas that the large solar device, the sun and large solar device, uh, would have taken up. But how much more clearly defined, how, how neat the edges are. Um, in, since the beginning of the gold paintings, these paintings really have represented the single most dominant format um, in Scott's work for and would do for the following. This was a format, this was a pictorial style, which he would take up and go with for the next four or five decades. Now, is, can you describe Scott's work as minimal, 
um, of course they're minimal in the sense that they're um, spare and economic, um, but um, minimalism generally refers to reducing the art object to um, just just to just that to just the physical presence of the material only. But in Scott's case, there is, um, I think, a kind of uh, a sense that is over and above just the physical presence of the painting. Um, there is a reference, I think, to something. Um, he is wary, though, of saying that they're in any way spiritual or transcendental, um, for all that they are meditative. Um, and he says in interviews that he didn't he claims that he didn't consciously try to generate any spiritual feeling in the work, that it was up to us, the viewer, to interpret the painting uh, as, we, as we see it ourselves. Um, visually, that, that's one thing, but what is also true of, of Scott's work, and, and I've talked about this already, is how fundamentally tactile they are. And that contrast between the raw, the weave of the canvas and the lustrous gold, uh, really, when you're beside a scott painting you really want to touch it you can't of course but you really want to touch it because that interplay between the textures is very um much part of the effect now he was famously reluctant to explain his paintings in any way or to speculate on the meaning of his work and one time when he was pushed he said well he had an he has a note he had a note displayed on his studio wall and the note read the circle is a symbol of fulfillment. He also remarked that his major influences as a painter include memories of the limit, that, that the kind of expand, that limitless expanse of water, the Atlantic Ocean at Kill Britain, the, the family farm, um, and also the Japanese flag, that flat solar disc against a white background. The sun, it too emerges as by far the most dominant motif throughout the entire range of his work. Now, of course, in many guises, uh, the moon also features symbolically kind of silver to the sun's gold. And we've seen the sun, of course, uh, being, the, being, being the dominant uh, motif, really, in the, in this, in the device series. Uh, with regard to Patrick Scott's legacy, um, he really evolved as an artist in a very singular way. He trained, of course, as an architect. He was self-taught as an artist. He was so engaged in his design practice. And he was very, um, at the time in, in Ireland, certainly very unique with, uh, in, in that he had such, um, he had real um, intention to, uh, to make sure that that, that, that that visual sense, that aesthetic sense would underlie every aspect of his life. Um, it was also interesting that he uh, wasn't, didn't care about the kind of cultural snobbery that existed at the time, and that which would separate um, craft work from fine art, um, and and much of what he did for the design company Signa, and any and anywhere else would be under the heading of commercial design, but that didn't bother him the slightest. He continued to work in, with both practices, and he felt free throughout his life to make many wonderful tapestries. Uh, he painted screens, uh, tables, um, lots of beautiful work. Here, in fact, is one of his uh, tapestries made by Aubusson, uh, made in 1971. And I show it to you, only I picked it out because it happens to be called Device and is reminiscent, I think, of the series of Device paintings. Um, that sort of central explosion um, that kind of otherworldly feel, I think. Um, these wonderful um, tapestries were made to work, and often they were commissions, in fact, for contemporary architecture. They really sort of to collaborate with the interiors and in contemporary architecture. Among his most noteworthy projects also was his 18-year term on the board of the Kilkenny Design Workshops. And he really threw himself into making that project work. He played a crucial role in the first Rosk exhibition in 1967, and in fact, in all of the following exhibitions uh, over the next 20 years. And um, this was, of course, this international exhibition, uh, art exhibition in Ireland of international contemporary art, which took place more or less every four years. 
um, he designed the cover of the catalogue every year. And this is the first of those catalogues there on the right hand side. And the original design is an oil on panel in the Irish Museum of Modern Art. And this was the symbol for Rosk. Um, uh, now, if you consider Scott's achievement in isolation, um, either as an architect or as a printmaker or as a painter, in each of these spheres, he was an exceptional talent. But if you look at his contribution in, in, in the round, in total, uh, it was absolutely huge, um, not to not Irish cultural life um, and to visual, um, the, the visual cultural world in the in mid to late 20th century. He was a founding member of ESDONA, the uh, Association of Artists in Ireland, and he was honoured, um, he was given the, the, the largest, the greatest honour of all, which is the, the Office of Say in 2007. Um, his work is, of course, included in national and um, municipal institution collections in Ireland, IMA and the Hugh Lane and Trinity and um, many others. Uh, most important in, in many corporate collections and private collections in Ireland, etc., as you would imagine. And just to conclude, um, looking back at our, our own piece, this large solar device, um, it's, it's the Hugh Lane Gallery and its collection are fortunate to have such a wonderful painting. It's a very significant painting in terms of Patrick Scott's practice. Um, it's uh, part of this series, the large, the solar devices, uh, which were to prove a real turning point in, in Scott's practice and his career. Uh, it happens also to be, as we've learned, a political commentary, um, a political commentary on, on, on its time, a political statement, if you like. Um, I hope you like the painting. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to keep an eye out on the Hugh Lane website and also their social media, of course, as well, Twitter and Instagram, um, because there's so many wonderful talks um, and information is available there uh, to check it out. Thanks so much again.